Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all as always. I'm Demi Mohammed, the program assistant at the Freer Gallery of Art. And we thank you for joining us today for our art-based meditation session brought to you by the National Museum of Asian Art. Today's meditation will be led by Aparna, and we are joined again by Simon Reddig, the museum's associate curator for the arts of the Islamic world, who will tell us a bit more about the artwork and answer your questions after the meditation. Today's art piece will be a folio that is dated from the 16th century and features beautiful calligraphy and gorgeous details. It is signed by the most celebrated 16th century Persian calligrapher, Mur Ali, and I am very excited to hear where it takes you all in today's meditation. Again, we thank you for joining us, and I'll pass it to Aparna to get us started. Thank you so much, Demi, for opening this session. Namaste to one and all who's here. Namaste, Associate Curator Simon. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to everybody for taking the time to be with us and uh, share with us this journey of art-inspired meditation. As Demi shared, our artwork for uh, inspiration would be a folio of calligraphy. And it has these beautiful details that we're going to look at in about a minute from now. And uh, I would like to share a little bit about how this continues our meditation practice from the last Friday's uh, art-based meditation. So last week, we meditated to young prince, his beautiful robe, which had very uh, sort of a strong imagery. And, uh, and we practiced uh, mindfulness, basically. We, we practiced these techniques of mindfulness to center our attention, uh, to embody ourselves, and so on and so forth. So today, uh, we will go through this folio, uh, continuing on that thread of mindfulness. So we'll start with what is the verse or the backside of that folio with the calligraphy. And then from there, we'll transition to the recto or the front side of that um, same folio. And as we do this, you will notice that there will be lots of questions that you have Maybe you're able to read the script, you, you know, and you're able to understand it, and maybe you're not. And in any of these situations, there'll be lots of thoughts that will take us away from the meditation itself. So when that happens, just know that you have a choice to come back to my voice and just take the practice from wherever the guidance is at that moment. So on that note, let's move on to take a look at this uh, work that really spans so many centuries because it's made in the... Uh, 16th century with a calligraphic style, which is from the 14th century. And the poetry that is written through this calligraphy is from the 12th century. So it's, it's just it's a work of art that spans so much across time. So let's go ahead and take our first look at the verse or the backside of this folio. And if you're curious about the details of this work, like you know the time that it was made, the artist, its dimensions, you can all check that out in the link that Demi just posted in the chat. And the idea of focusing on this very, very bright, luminous work of art, to really exemplify the practice of mindfulness, where even if we didn't know anything about the artwork, even if we cannot understand anything, we can always awaken ourselves to what we feel as we guide our awareness through this work of art. We'll come back to the work in a moment. For now, let's just center our attention. Please find a way of sitting upright, maybe supporting your back. To ensure that the feet can touch the floor or something underneath. There's that quality of body being supported, which eventually becomes a feeling of being anchored. the body can enjoy a form of stillness, can be sustained for as long as it's possible. And 
And imagine your attention to be like this spotlight that you're moving from your feet to crown. So at each part of the body, you're able to check in with the sensations there. Doing so without the intention of changing anything, let it be. Just notice what's going on, what's present and unfolding. So we're aware that this is how consciousness within is embodying itself through the mind, through the body, through all of those bodily sensations, thoughts, feelings, emotions. And you could also take a moment to notice how the body is placed with respect to the space surrounding it. And now, having centered our attention, having cultivated some more embodiment, if you open our eyes, And let's take first look, just trying to connect with the artwork, connect your attention to the artwork. At this level of Zoom, what are the details you can notice? What stands out for you? And then can you pay attention to the qualities that where your attention is naturally drawn to makes it stand out from the rest of this folio. So now this focal point for your attention becomes like sort of an anchor or a thread can draw you back to the artwork anytime your attention wanders away. Let's start by first focusing on the outermost part, the this really illuminating part. I'll be the, the board on which this folio is mounted. For the details, the foliage, sometimes what may seem like bunches of fruits or clusters of blossoms. All of that reminding us of the time of the year we're in, surrounded by trees and plants that are beginning to drape on lush blankets of green foliage and vividly colored flowers. And when our hearts feel filled in this appreciation of natural beauty around us, we could slowly guide our attention to the inner frames, the cartouches, rectangular frames. Maybe at this resolution, it just seems somewhat golden, somewhat pinkish, peachish tone. But let's zoom in. And 
here we can appreciate these really tiny, delicate, but precious blooms adorning this frame. That takes your breath away. Take a deep breath in through the nose. Deep breath out, maybe through the mouth. And then let's continue to guide our attention further in. Finding this another sort of an inset rectangular frame again is filled with floral details, but also there are these organic shapes here, somewhat like clouds. Clouds that are carrying very fluidic lines of the calligraphy. Slowly taking our time, look at all of these intricate details. And then when we enter this innermost rectangular space, it just looks so much like a garden full of diverse flowers, diverse shapes, sizes, colors. Some of them fully blossomed, some of them like buds and partially blossomed buds. Then we notice that this garden-like space is somewhat compartmentalized by these two rectang uh, triangular spaces. And one of these has calligraphy, while the other continues with a set of assorted blossoms. Why could that be? Why, why did the artist feel inspired to create these two triangular segments? But at least visually, we find that the presence of this triangle for further brackets or, or sort of defines the space, which has these cloud-like shapes with all this beautiful fluidic lines of the Nastali calligraphy. You could pay attention to the distribution of each shape, each form here, in terms of horizontal and vertical dimensions. And how interesting that all of this has been placed in a slanting orientation instead of just putting it plain horizontal. And all of this creates the sense of the consciousness resting in the freshness of the spring garden and these clouds carrying these verses, like thoughts being carried in the clouds across the sky. Now for a few moments, let's meditate to that imagination. 
So feel free to close your eyes. And just imagine that you're looking at the sky, which here represents your mind. And each cloud, a thought. Even describe these thoughts. Like you could imagine as if each cloud has a word written on it that describes the thought itself. And just like this slanting alignment of the calligraphy here, suggesting movement, allow your thoughts, allow those clouds to come and go. And always choose to skip any thought that is so overwhelming that it's not safe for you to process all by yourself. In that case, you can just come back to your breath, place a hand over the heart and feel the breath. If you're able to hold a safe space for your thoughts all by yourself, just Observe these clouds of thoughts come and go. Practice this in silence for a minute. Now that we've trained ourselves a little bit, witness our own thoughts. We could open our eyes, look at the entire folio all at once, and notice or witness what are the thoughts coming up now. And you could close your eyes or look away from the screen just for a moment. And try to collect the narrative that your mind is telling you based on your intuitive experience of the calligraphy side of the folio. What is any stories? The mind is trying hard to stitch up with whatever details the senses could perceive. And then let that be. Now we'll move our attention to the recto or the front side of that folio. It's again mounted on this illuminated board. With rectangular frames inset. And right here at the center, we see this image. The title of this is Shah Jahan standing on earth or Emperor Shah Jahan standing on earth. When we look at this image, what thoughts come to our mind? What are the details we are able to notice visually?
then as we zoom into this part with half of the globe or Earth, it's interesting to see a lion seated next to maybe a ram, and that topped by these scales. And then at the periphery of this half circle, we find human figures. And some of them look like they've raised their hands in prayer. Some of them holding banners, again, with calligraphy. We find the Emperor Shah Jahan standing on all of this, on top of this, like he's present, embodied, and in charge, in charge of this. This imagery bow of the cherubic angels. One holding a crown, one holding a sword, the other offering shade. So now let's look away from the painting, try to visualize all these details in our mind's eye. And then you know that this is the front side of the folio to which the calligraphy side was the back side. How is your mind trying to connect these? What is the narrative going on now? Having made a mental note of that, Let's open our eyes to focus on the presence of Emperor Shah Jahan here as a reminder to become even more embodied, embodied not just through the physical body, but also what is called as the energetic body or the pranamaya kosha. Towards that end, let's practice a chakra-based or chakra-inspired meditation. Please sit comfortably. Maybe close your eyes. And let's once again guide our awareness through each part of the body. This time, noticing the sensations as well as the shape of the body, the space holding those sensations. Let's begin with the feet. the lower legs, the knees, the thighs, the hips and the seat, the front of the torso, The back of the torso, the shoulders and the entire torso, the upper arms, elbows, forearms, wrists and the hands. the neck, the head, the entire body. And we become aware of the entire body's sensations and space containing those sensations. So we can know our body's presence intuitively without having to see it or move it.
And we relax into the space. We perceive the space to be as effortless as possible. And then we'll guide our attention through the seven chakras along the central energy channel. For each, we will focus on the what's believed to be the physical location. Then I'll chant the seed syllable or the Bija mantra three times. Welcome to repeat those chants silently. Or you can also choose to focus on the vibrations of those sounds, those syllables. You can also focus on that vibration in that space of the chakra that we're meditating to. Let's start by placing our attention to the space between the eyebrows, the third eye. The third eye chakra or the Agya chakra. The Bija mantra, the seed syllable for this is Om. Om. Gently guide your attention to the crown. Crown chakra or the Sahasrara chakra. Again has the Bija mantra Om. Om. Your awareness descend down to the center of your throat. The throat chakra or the Vishuddhi chakra has the Bija mantra, hum, as in H U M, hum. 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 Bring your awareness further down to the heart space, the Anahata Chakra, which has the Bija Mantra, Yam, like Y-U-M or Y-A-M. Yam. Yum. Yum. Let your awareness descend down to the solar plexus. About four fingers distance above the navel. Seed syllable for the solar plexus chakra or the Manipura is Ram, like R U M. Ram. 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 
further bring your awareness down to the sacral chakra, about four fingers below the navel. The seed syllable for the sacral chakra or Swadishthana is VAM, like V-A-M, VAM. 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 Now bringing all the way down our attention to the Muladhara Chakra or Root Chakra. Sija Mantra, Lam. 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 Having thus enlivened all the chakras, the energy centers along the central channel, corresponding to the spine. Stay deep breaths in, visualizing light to flow through the body. The whole body becomes illuminated with this light that is right within ourselves. Nothing to bring from outside. Already here. Waiting for our consciousness to be awakened to it. This light creates a radiance all around us, just like the glow around Shah Jahan's head. And may this awareness of being the entire ocean in a single drop give us the strength, focus, courage, and determination to win over our circumstances. On that note, confidence. Maybe close our practice, joining palms in prayer, bowing to the light within and the power of the will within. May we bow to all the teachings of yoga and the teachers through whom we receive these teachings. May we bow to each other, like we're saying, the light in me honors the light in you. And we move from darkness to light, from that which is false to truth. May we all be happy and peaceful. Peace be to all. Peace be to all. Peace be to all. Thank you so much for choosing to share your presence and practice with us this afternoon. I hope this practice was useful to you. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions for me, please let me know. Uh, anyone who's celebrating Nowruz, happy Nowruz to you. And now let me transition the screen to Demi and Simon. Well, thank you, Aparna. I will pass it on to Simon. I... Thank you, Demi. And thank you, Aparna, for this wonderful um, session and meditation. Um, let's have a closer look now at the calligraphy. I don't know if you see my screen. All good? All good. Yes, all good. So the quatrain inscribed in diagonal on this page is by celebrated Persian lyric poet Hafez of Shiraz, who died in 1390. It reads, the porter willingly carries his master's possessions to safety when the flood comes. So in life, when trouble overwhelms us, the good spirit will help us carry out burdens. This short piece of poetry is among the thousand ones you would find in an album, 
a compilation of multifarious materials ranging from paintings and drawings to calligraphic works, usually not related one with each other in terms of content. Here, you would turn the page of the album, read this piece, meditate and reflect on its meaning. You would also be most certainly struck by the beauty of the calligraphy. The undulating strokes sweep diagonally across the page as if they were echoing the rhythm of the recited verses. They are written in a script called Nas Talik. This script was elaborated in the second half of the 14th century in Iran. It is said to have been developed to pen works in Persian and not Arabic. And the style was so successful that it came to embody the Persian language itself. With its sinuous lines, short vertical strokes, and astonishing sense of rhythm, Nastalik was particularly well suited for copying Persian verse. After 1500, in Iran, India, Turkey, wherever Persian was the language of culture, calligraphers used such short poems, not only to exhibit their artistic skills, but also to explore the aesthetic potential of this particular script. Gradually, they enlarged the scale of the letters, experimented with their placement on the page, and refined their flourishes to create, like here, bold displays of a few lines of poetry on a single sheet. By manipulating the size, position, and placement of individual letters and their relationship to each other, Nastalik itself ultimately became as important as the meaning it conveyed. This idea is best illustrated by calligraphic works by um, Mir Ali Haravi from Herat, active in the first half of the 16th century, who excelled in creating large scale, large scale guitars that is both fragments of poetry and calligraphy samples, like you see here, with Mir Ali's signature in the lower corner triangle. So that is signature, the humble Mir Ali. Tadi Ahmad, who completed a treatise on calligraphy around 1600, wrote about Mir Ali Haravi. He brought the art of the large and small script and the writing of samples to the, utmost, to the utmost degree of perfection. Raised in Herat in present-day Western Afghanistan, Mir Ali worked there in the royal workshops of the Timurid and the Safavid dynasty. He witnessed the Uzbek seizure of the city in 1528. Forced into exile in Bukhara in present-day Uzbekistan, Mir Ali served the Khans of the Uzbek Shaibani dynasty until his death around 1545. In the numerous poetic verses he composed in Persian and Turkic, calligraphers were often uh, poets as well, Mir Ali often lamented the cruelty of destiny and the fact he would never visit his birthplace and beloved city of Herat again. He may have been depressed and borderline, but in terms of artistic production, Mir Ali was extremely prolific. Hundreds of works signed by him survive to the present day. And many, in fact, were made by his students. In an unusual move for a renowned artist indeed, Mir Ali allowed his pupils to sign their well-executed pieces with his own name and then be sold at the market. The Mughal emperors admired his calligraphic hand and avidly collected his works. It is particularly true of Shah Jahan, who reigned between 1627 and 1657. So this folio comes from the so-called late Shah Jahan album, now dispersed, and all the calligraphies in these albums are by Mir Ali Haravi. The present folio is also more famous 
um, for its back as you as you see during the meditation session and that you see now on the screen, which present a portrait of Shah Jahan standing on a globe and dated uh, 1618. The album was compiled at the end of Shah Jahan's reign, so after 1650. And that is also when the pages were decorated with these superb naturalistic flowers. So the calligraphy was made around like 1550 in Bukhara by Mir Ali. The calligraphy then traveled to India, where it was probably in the library of the Mughal emperor. And a century later, around 1650, an artist added the flowers and the gilding around the calligraphy. But little attention has been paid also to the small inscriptions that you see on the folio. They may well be by Mir Ali, as they speak in his name and directly address the reader of the large calligraphy in the center of the page. And these small lines read, anyone who understands the art of calligraphy knows that it must come from the heart as well as from the fingers. For example, I write the smallest of Persian scripts. I speak with the hand and I also speak with the tongue. From the skillful, thus, comes, thus come pearls of great price and thus from such a delicate hand comes exquisite poetry. Therefore, it is the most precious of possessions and one to be bargained for in the bazaars. If this beauty is appreciated, then it is desired above all things because of the beauty of its letters and smoothness of its verses. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for sharing more information with us about this beautiful artwork. It's uh, very interesting to hear that he would let his students sign his name um, so that they could sell their work in the in the store. I think that that's a... Uh... He would sell the works and get oh, the money. Would, yeah. That's the thing. Ah. <laughs> that's really He's cool. the master, you know, so... Yeah. Is it... Um, I know sometimes that in specific uh, countries and things, it was traditional that some an art like this would be passed down through their families. Was that typical for calligraphy in this time period? Or was it something more like if he had a bunch of students, it was more of a school and people would come and... Um... Um, so the, it wouldn't work at a school, you know, it would hmm. here, I mean, it would be attached to the, um, to the workshop library of, uh, of the prince, basically. Hmm. Um, and so it would work mainly for the prince, but it would also work for himself, you know? Mm -hmm. He has to leave, you know? And it's yeah. like, it's by producing and selling those pieces that you get money. Um, mm -hmm. And the anecdote, there is a famous anecdote about um, about that is that, you know, it was, um, it was um, I don't know if it's him or another famous calligrapher, but he was on the market and he needed bread and he didn't have money on him. So he, he made a piece of calligraphy on a piece of paper and gave it to the baker. So, and got <laughs> bread, you know, for, for, for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, it, there were calligraphy. I mean, these calligraphers were like the Picassos of the time mm -hmm. over there, you know? So it's, it's pretty astonishing, you know, that you think that the Mughal emperors, so in another country that's not close, you know, India and Uzbekistan, there is some mm -hmm. distance, you know. Um, a century later, as well, like collecting those, those works, you know, they were like sending people to buy and find those calligraphies anywhere they want and bring them to the palace. And then they would mount them into, sometimes decades later, you know, mm -hmm. mount them into albums. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> Um, Inez is asking, <clears throat> excuse me, if the calligraphy is written from left to right or right to left. Yeah, and I should have said that. Um, you need to look at the calligraphy from right to left. If you do it from left to right, it hurts. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> you feel you're, you know, hurting the, you don't see the flow, 
actually mm -hmm. to, to feel the flow of the calligraphy, you really need to, uh, to, to look at it from uh, right to, um, to left. And don't try on the calligraphy that is behind me because like on the screen, it's, it is in reverse. So <laughs> that doesn't make sense, uh, make sense at all. But um, yes, always, always look from right to left. And then uh, Inez is also asking if some of it is printed and if it is made with layers of paper. So it's not printed. Huh? It's written with a pen and a, a reed pen and ink. Um, um, this, that's very important. It's on papers. Um, and then the paper are pasted on pasteboard. And then you have cardboards. I mean, every, every single uh, element that you see is mm -hmm. a different piece of paper actually so the margins it's several layers of papers and the um the the zone where it was pasted is hidden by lines you know so you would have like wool wool, wool lines mm -hmm. a gold of, of colors that would hide basically the um where it was cut and put together uh, um it's very 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 nice work you know very mm -hmm. well done yeah um Deborah's in the chat saying that Picasso also signed a couple of doodles on cocktail napkins. So it's very <laughs> reminiscent. <Yeah. laughs> uh, Linda's asking, is it true that the Shah Jahan put to death the creator of the Taj Mahal so that no one could have access or understand how it was created? I don't know if I know. Um, <laughs> I don't I don't know. And I'm not specialist of Mughal architecture. So um, <laughs> I know there is a story like that, but um, um, uh, I'm not sure it's true. Mm. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> definitely it wouldn't put like calligraphers to death. You know, yeah. put. Um, Very true. <laughs> Tim is asking if you can comment on the winged angels and why they are coming out of seeming thunder clouds. Oh, they're just coming. I mean, this, yeah, the clouds are. Well, those angels, they look very U European also, you must mm. note. And it's, be and it's because the artist was basically emulating uh, European models, paintings. Uh, so they look more like putty than, you know, those angel and cherubines like these Western this angels that you see in, uh, in Western art that than uh, angels that you would see in Persian paintings. Um, very sort of realistic and like, like um, they look like, you know, babies and children, like angels in Persian paintings and Mughal paintings, they look like fairies, I would say more, mm -hmm. um, uh, and they're not naked, never. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and what's interesting here, yeah, yeah they, they, they hold um, symbol of kinship. Uh, kingship with a G mm -hmm. uh, and and power. So like the um, the uh, the parasol, the umbrella is a symbol of royalty. And mm -hmm. actually, on this one, it's written the names of all the kings uh, before Shah Jahan's and and back to Timur. You mm -hmm. know, Timur Tamerlane, uh, the great you know warrior from coming from Uzbekistan, is actually the um, the origin of uh, the Mughal emperors. So um, that's written on the, um, on the parasol, I mean, the sort of umbrella. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is, Paula, uh, sorry, Pamela is asking if you can reread the poetry, but if you also had that um, maybe available to put in the chat, if you could, if it was easily accessible for you. Um, Sure. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not tech savvy, so I'm just. Yeah, gonna, no, you're fine. Um, let me. Um, I don't know how to do that. No, no worries. You can just read it again if. Um, yeah. So the, I'll read the main, the main, um, the main piece, mm -hmm. um, which is the porter willingly carries his master's possessions to safety when the flood comes. So in life, when trouble overwhelms us, the good spirit will help us carry out burdens. 
that's a rough translation, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's very timely <laughs> but but we get the uh, you get the meaning mm -hmm. <laughs> the profound yeah. meaning of of um of that <laughs> and adrian is asking if these poems would also have been set to music in the time period um no but you know po poetry persian poetry is like music mm -hmm. you know it's so melodious yes that you don't need to put an instrument uh, behind you know mm -hmm. um just go on YouTube, you know, and enter like recitation of Persian poetry, and you will see, uh, you will see how melodious it is. Mm -hmm. And then it, it's very interesting, but do that and look at calligraphy at the same time, even if it's not the same text, and you will, you will hear like the, the melody, the sinuosity of the poetry is reflected in the lines, mm -hmm. you know, of, of, of writings. It's, Incredible. I wonder if the flow together. also helped people meditate afterwards. You know, you said that you you read it and then you sort of meditate on it. And then if the if the flow is there sometimes, then you know you get that meditative state. <laughs> oh, probably. <laughs> Linda is asking if they had access to Chinese calligraphy. Um yes, I mean, you know, China was next door. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of exchanges between China and uh, um, the courts of Iran, Central Asia. Um, um, then, you know, it's two, two completely different languages and alphabets, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's Persian is using the Arabic alphabet uh, and Chinese is using this, you know, its own characters so mm -hmm. um and and also you know you do chinese calligraphy with a brush you never use a brush for uh calligraphy in islam you use a reed pen mm -hmm. that's really cool it's a good distinction to know i think mm. if people want to you know come to the museum and see the differences in them so all right. Well, we are at our time today. So we thank you, Simon, for joining us. It's always well, a pleasure to have you. Always a pleasure to come and uh, happy Noruz, uh, Noruz Mubarak to yes. uh, all celebrating and uh, happy Holi as well. I've heard happy it's, Holi uh, as well. yes. <laughs> it's the Holi Festival. So. Yes. so we thank you. Thank you, Aparna, as always. It's always a pleasure every every Friday to join you. Um, the museum is open. I've put some links in the chat if you would like to join us. Um, Simon, let us know that there is some more Persian, Persian calligraphy in galleries three and four um, in the Freer Gallery of Art. So if you come by, <clears throat> make sure you come by and utilize what you learned today in, uh, in the meditation. And we hope that you have a great weekend. We thank you for joining us every week. <laughs> always great to see everyone yeah thank you so much everybody um you know uh it's just i'm still still thinking about simon's words of you know the flow of calligraphy and and the quality of music in it and and all of this adding up to a meditation like state um yeah so thank you so much simon for all of that um we hope to you know see you again soon on this program and uh thanks to everyone who's here See you all on Monday as we meditate again together. Thank you so much for being here with us now. Take care. Bye. Bye.